Ho! Hello, Alaska! Thank you for tuning in again today for another Meet the Candidates. Today I am sitting here with John Nelson, who is uh, running for the House of Representatives uh, Congress for Alaska to represent us down in D.C. And uh, for those that are, are just not too aware of what that means, uh, Senator Don, or, uh, Congressman Don Young, who has been in office for 47 years, this is the seat that he is looking to jump right on into. And please, tell us who you are. Um, and uh, I want to just jump right on into it right here. And there, there's one thing about you that I find is unique. You have an idea that uh, to make this transition a lot more different than any other candidate has ever proposed before out there. That's true. Very much so. So, uh, Bert, thank you very much for allowing me to come in and uh, share uh, what I call a message to Alaska and a true succession strategy. A uh, little background on myself, uh, born and raised here in Alaska, I was a product of the 64 earthquake, literally. The earthquake happened and nine months later I was born. <laughs> and uh, I, I kind of joke about that, but that was, that was back when Alaska was Alaska. And uh, it, it, uh, I was raised in a different generation. But when I was in the sixth grade, I sent the newly elected Congressman Don Young a letter. And he replied back with a signed autograph, congressional picture and all of that stuff. And when I became of voting age, I uh, talked to my dad and I said, hey, what is this about parties and elections and political affiliates and stuff? And he says, I want you to go to every platform and look at them all the Democrat, the Republican, the Libertarian, all of them. And I went and I looked at them and I, the one that resonated most with me was the Republican uh, Party. And so I signed up as a Republican and I voted for... Well, hold on in here a second. To the Republican Party. Elaborate just a little bit more because of yeah. why the Republican Party versus anybody else? I mean, what, what values did the Republican Party have? that intrigued you to become one? Great question. So the big thing that resonated with me was I remember in the sixth grade, I did a report on uh, John Quincy Adams, one of our presidents. And that was back when school used to teach a little bit about history on our constitution. And the constitution became something to me that intrigued me about uh, a, 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 the foundation of our government. And it's not a liberal or a conservative or a left or right issue. It's, it's the foundation of our government. And so that was the big part that resonated with me. And then the rest of the values, you know, I mean, believing that a man and a woman were, you know, to be under holy matrimony. And, and, uh, and those were just things that were important to me. And so... Uh, and I remind you, we, we are going back to like the... the yeah, early late 70s. Well, that, in the 70s, yeah. yeah. And so in the 80s, when I could vote, I voted for Ronald Reagan. I uh, um, I remember that after he got shot, that was a big thing to me because you know he, somebody tried to assassinate him, and like they tried to like they took out Kennedy. I mean, it was a big thing, and my mom was you know really impacted by that. And I remember where I was at when that happened. You know, coming back from a uh, 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 a chiropractor, I think it was, and and uh, but anyway, so I, I I registered as a, a Republican, and my wife and I have been married for 33 years. Congratulations! <laughs> <laughs> right, it's kind of a milestone in it, today's it day is, and age. And I've got four kids or three kids and four grandkids. Our fourth one is on its way right, on his way right now, and uh, uh, so when I went to vote I, and. My wife and I, we went out there and being responsible adults and we got involved in the politics and, and then we got into business and I've been self-employed virtually all of my adult life. And my wife and I, we started business before we got married in 87. And so uh, as we move forward, we got busy with business and raising a family. And I raised my family of 30 years in Chugiak. We homeschooled our kids up until about the sixth grade. They went into uh, uh, Chugiak High School and graduated from there and uh, because of the after school activities the extracurricular stuff my son was big into football and to wrestling and and I have I, I've always been civic minded 
you know, giving to the community, being a part of it. You know, if I if I'm going to be a, go to a football game, I'm not just going to be a spectator and raw my son on. I'm going to be involved. And so I got involved with the booster clubs and, you know, from, you know, early on with Chugiak Youth Sports Association and and being on the board there and being active in the community. And as I did that, um, you know, it's just part of civic responsibility, I believe. And about 18 years ago, somebody sat down with me and they taught me how money worked and I got mad. I'm like, why aren't we teaching our own kids our own form of economics, which is free enterprise, by the way. Yep. And we're not teaching them how money works. And so I actually got excited. And that's what led me into the financial services industry. Started out with uh, correcting an injustice with insurance. And it's interesting because in, in the transition, and, and I haven't told a lot of people this, but I'm happy to share it out there because I think it's important people understand where I'm coming from. Being self-employed, I expanded out my businesses. And uh, after September 11th, 2001, my business blew up. It, it totally went, it just fell apart, I should say. Um, I had an employee that went AWOL and I had a six figure debt. And I gave people my word that I was gonna pay them off. And three years ago, I finally paid that debt off. Wow. Because of my word. And that's the integrity that I had because I was raised, if, if I ain't got my word, I ain't got nothing. I do business with my handshake and my word. And that's important. That's part of my moral values and my core belief system. And then that's clearly been missing out there nowadays. It uh, really I, has, it really it has. Sounds like your core values are a lot like my own. Um, I, I was raised that if you give a promise, you, you give your word, you're gonna do something. As best as I can. You, you, no matter mm -hmm. what, even if it takes you longer than what you had originally planned, you still keep your word and you still do it. You don't make excuses and, and try to explain it away and say, oh, it's not my problem anymore. It's, to me, an excuse is a skin of a reason stuffed with a lie. <laughs> That's the way I look at it. And it's a cliche, I guess you could say. But, uh, you know, I think it's also important that, you know, as, as I, went forward in the financial services industry, my core values continued with me. Um, I, I went on to become a branch manager of a local bank, went on to uh, work at Merrill Lynch to become a full-fledged financial advisor. And it was during the 0809 financial services meltdown that I started looking at ways to protect my clients' net worth and their interests. And, uh, and that led me on a quest for truth in the financial industry, which then, how do I fix this? What do I do? How can I make it better? What can I do uh, to solve the situations and the issues that I saw were you know, glaring at me at the time? But as a financial advisor, I'm held to a higher standard. We have compliance. And so uh, in that, I take continuing education every couple of years. And uh, it's, it, it's something that is it, it, it's acting ethically in our well, client's best interests. Well, let's compare that to the, the position that you're, you're currently going into. Right. Um, I, I would look at it as they're not held under the same kind of scrutiny or the, the background checks or anything else along those lines to make sure that you yourself have a, a good financial grasp on how to actually survive in the world. And, and how to make your money work for you. Exactly, um, exactly. And I'm already held to a higher standard than our elected officials. You know, I, I manage millions of dollars, but as a congressman, I would manage billions of dollars. And why should we not hold our elected officials to the same standard I'm held to? If I was involved in the backroom deals and the insider trading that the the elected officials have committed, I'd be thrown in jail. Yes. And that's appalling to me. Not to mention, think about this, the retirement accounts of our judges. How much do they hold in individual corporate stock positions of the same very companies they're defending? Uh, scarily way too many. And, and, and it's, it's, it's nerve wrackingly con it's concerning. You know, we've got, We've got elected officials that are making 
becoming multimillionaires at our expense. And those are the things that kept me up. And so when I started to look for solutions, um, it led me to the Constitution. And I'm like, holy smokes. We, it, you know, the way it was put to me is, what are, my, what are the five liberties of the First Amendment? And I'm like, uh, freedom of speech, uh, right to keep and bear out. No, 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 that's the Second Amendment, right? And so I started learning. And I was like, man, I, I've got to get up to speed really fast because I'm not sure if I was asleep in that class, Bert, or what. But, you know, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, the right to peacefully assemble, the right to, uh, you know, to go to the church that I want to go to, and the right to protest of our grievances against our government. Right. In fact, it's interesting because after the, uh, this pandemic that we've all been put under, the mandates that were coming out, I, with a group of other people, put all of the mandates up against the U.S. Constitution and, and the state of Alaska's Constitution. And by the third mandate, we had given up all our rights. And not a peep to be heard by people freely giving up their First Amendment rights. Uh, we've seen that Concerning. here locally on, on, a, on a major scale here over the last couple of months. That's right, um, that's right. From, uh, I'm just gonna bring the mayor into this discussion sure. slightly here and, and say we've got the, the Black Lives Matter protests that began with uh, George Floyd's death, which uh, current video that's come out from the Daily Mail shows us all that we've, we've got virtually another hands up incident going here that there was a reason why they hid that body cam footage from us all. But the reason why I bring that up is because they had the protests that happened in Anchorage. The mayor, ignoring his own mandates, shows up at these protests and, and gives them a big pat on the back saying, this is acceptable, you guys can do it. And then let's fast forward to what happened in this, this last past week. We've got the same mayor, we've got protests happening in front of the Lusak Library, protesting our freedom of speech to be able to assemble, to be able to give testimony directly to, which was ignored, doors being barred and locked on the, the people of Alaska. We have no more rights to being able to be, to be represented. Well, think about this for a moment. It's, it's my understanding that that's against the law, that, that we're, the, the assembly, the Anchorage Assembly, is supposed to hold open door meetings and yet they've closed the doors to the public. Yeah. That's against the, that's a violation in, in my opinion, that's a violation of our constitutional rights. And then we're peacefully protesting out in front of there. Um, we were declared a possible riot going on outside of the building. Um, they passed an ordinance while they were That's sitting right. in there That's right. to, to say that the 500 to almost 1,000 people that were outside were illegally protesting and to be removed from the property that we paid Which for. Which is the First Amendment, the right to peacefully assemble. The right to peacefully assemble. We have the right. Think about this for a moment, the, the freedom of speech. <laughs> Back when our forefathers wrote the Constitution, we didn't have Zoom. We didn't have cell phones. And so their right to, to freedom of speech was the ability to travel from their home down to their Capitol building and protest. And peacefully a protest, not riots. That's not a peaceful protest. No, not, and so like what we've been seeing nowadays, uh, at least not in Alaska. Anyways, exactly. You know, well, thank God. Other areas, thank yes. God. But what I saw actually uh, the other night from the assembly meeting after hours was... Uh, reminiscent of what I would think would be going on in, in Detroit or in, in Seattle or Portland. And is that what we're becoming? That's, that's very concerning. You know, I was born and raised in Anchorage. You know, this is my home. And I want my children and my grandchildren to have a better future than I've had. And so that's part of why I got involved in the politics, because as, as a financial advisor, I'm held to a higher standard. I'm, you know, I'm, I have to participate in what's called pay to play, okay? Which means I have to have compliance approval before I do any outside business activity. And so when I ran for Congress two years ago, it took me 30 days 
to get my compliance department to give me approval to run a campaign, to raise any money for a campaign. And I ran a zero-based budget campaign last time, two years ago, and I'm running a zero-based budget campaign this time. In other words, I'm not spending any money until I raise it. Well, we need some fiscal policy in Washington, D.C., and it's Congress that holds the purse strings, and we've got to hold them accountable. Which, which is definitely not happening at this point. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, this would be a great time to bring up the debt clock. <laughs> I mean, and, and the, the outrageous spending. I yeah. Mean, we, we think what happened under Obama was bad, you know, adding nine, ten trillion dollars onto that debt. This coronavirus just in the last past, since in the last five months. Yep. Since the first of the year, we put on almost seven trillion on the Fed's balance sheet. Nobody's even balking at it. After, they're not even bringing it up in their conversations. They're not bringing it up. Yet, in the 0809 financial services meltdown, they uh, it, it took an act of Congress to give some uh, $800 billion to bail out the banks. And we've already spent $7 trillion, $7 trillion yeah. on, the, on the balance sheet. You know, and yeah, the feds have put a floor on the market to keep this health... Uh, crisis be, from becoming a financial crisis, which, you know, uh, there's there's a whole lot of concern there well, as well. Which financial crisis? The one that's happening right now or the one that our children, our grandchildren are going to be facing Bur very rapidly? We're, we're in 10 years of being in total bankruptcy it, as a state, it, as, a, as a nation. You're so correct there. And that's part of the, the, the part that I can offer Congress. Um, you know, money is math. Math is a science, and we can do the math. From 1980, we went from $900 billion, that's not even a trillion, $900 billion in debt in 1980 to almost $27 trillion in debt today. And it's expected in the next five to seven years, that number will double again. We have yeah. So especially, uh, I'll throw it out there, especially if we have someone like Biden who uh, or Biden, and I, I always uh, get his name screwed up on purpose. <laughs> if we are to have him become elected, we've got the Green New Deal that they want to do. There, there's an easily $70 billion price tag attached to that. And that's not even the reoccurring charges that will be created to pay for it all it's, year after it's year. It's about after carbon that. tax credits. And they want to they want to tax us on the carbon tax for how much carbon we uh, uh, exhaust and and how much we produce. Well, how do we charge the cows? Uh, I've got to throw that one out there just because <laughs> you know when it, when it comes to that carbon output, you know. It, well, I, we got a huge issue right now because uh, I've I've been raising the alarm for months as far as the coming food shortage, and because our supply chain has been fractured. That's decimated. You can see it in the grocery it stores. It really empty has. shelves everywhere. It has. And, and those are things that need to be addressed in Congress. But today, Congress is recessed for 30 days in the middle of a pandemic. And when, when we are, are, people are unemployed, they, they're, they're looking for guidance. They're looking for assistance on navigating through it themselves. Yet our leaders are... Missing in action would be the they're, best way to describe it. Yep, on vacation for 30 days, I guess. So uh, accountability is the ability to count. And we have to have fiscal policy that is a, a, a sound financial plan, a sound financial budget. Um, and, and we've got missing money that, that isn't accounted for. We have... Social Security, which they, the, the uh, Social Security Trust Fund is expecting that it would run out of money by 2035. I'll, I'll, I'm just going to bring this up right yeah. now. We've got the Social Security. It's a big hot button in the news right now um, because uh, President Trump That's wants right. to eliminate payroll taxes. It's been eliminated. It's been, it's been passed through the end of the year that, and hey, no payroll tax, and that's what funds Social Security. But uh, it, it, they don't want to acknowledge that they got all this wasteful spending that's going on out there that they could just rein back in and fund the Social Security, which has been proposed more than once from the mm -hmm. conservative party out mm -hmm. there versus what 
we're hearing coming from the Democrats, and they're, they're throwing out there, well, you can't do that. That money can't be used for that. Uh, we need to make sure that, that the people that don't, uh, do, do, that are already got billions of dollars get billions more dollars because that's where that money should go, not to the people that have put in all their lives. How about constitutional spending limits? How about we get back to that? How about we take every, um, let's just call it an alphabet agency, and audit them, including the Federal Reserve, which is nothing about federal about the Federal Reserve. I would love, personally, I would love to see an audit done. Um, but how in the world do we get this through Congress? I mean, we got here locally. We've been de demanding an audit now for darn near a decade, and we've still yet to get our own state to do one. I have an idea on that. And I would enact a legislation, and I would call it the Golden Rule Act. Okay. If I could put one act through Congress, I would put the Golden Rule Act through Congress. And it would be, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. And inside of the Golden Rule Act, it would, it would account for accountability of our elected officials. I would require them to fill out a job application because we're hiring them to do a job. And I would put in there uh, about their knowledge of the Constitution and then hold them accountable to when they stand up and put their hand on the Bible and, and swear an oath to uphold and defend the Constitution that we actually uphold and defend the Constitution and we hold them accountable to that well, instead of passing laws that bypass the Constitution. Well, that would theory, be one start. In, in theory, that sounds like a great idea. I mean, I really do love the golden rule idea, but what happens when we've got legislators or our Senate, our House of Representatives down there, congressmen, um, that are there that uh, don't care about ethics or being able to be accountable for what they say and do. Well, and that's where bringing them up to a higher standard is something that all voters should demand of our elected officials. Well, and that would be included in the Golden Rule Act because as a financial advisor, I file what's called a U4. That U4 is my track record that follows me for life. It's public information and if I commit a, a crime, it's reported on there. It reports the history of my job reporting on there. If so I, if you had inside trading, so to speak, uh, <laughs> well, like uh, Congress has been... No, I'd just be thrown in jail and they would, for, they would throw away the key and they would forget who I was. And what happens to a congressman if they do inside trading? <laughs> uh, well, you know, they get a good old boy, good job, and uh, hey, Don't where's the next again? deal? Yeah. No. It, it, you know, we have corporations right now that violate the law, and I could go down the list of them. And they, they commit felony and fraud. And it's bad boy. Don't get caught again. And they still act in business. They're still running in business today. I'm that P to P me. I'm just going to throw PG&E out there because of, you know, that, that's. In California, the electric company in California. Absolutely. And then, well, in order to protect it, they have to, they have to pass legislation to protect the company from being sued. I mean, where's the ludicrousy of this? I mean, we got it's a good insane. example just locally. We got Exxon Valdez. Well, I mean, that was one one of the biggest. Uh, I here, remember here's that. A slap on the hand for ya. you. You just destroyed I an entire that. ecological environment that's out there for decades, and uh, the, nothing much is going to happen to you other than you're just going to pay a little bit out of your own pocket, and then we'll call it good. Um, and, and there's still a lot of controversy over that. And that's actually interesting because that actually got us out of one of the recessions Alaska went through. But we were we were in a bad recession. We were, when our and people it, were getting their homes foreclosed yep, on, packing yep, up and leaving yep, the state. Yep. 100,000 people during that period same, left, packed it, up and left. That's right. Same thing that happened, uh, you know, when, uh, you know, the housing bubble blew up here. You know, and we were protected from that in 08, 09 somewhat because we remembered that. But think about this for a moment. We've, we've been in a recession over the last number of years here in Alaska. One of the only industries that's actually expanded has been healthcare yep. because of Medicare and Medicaid. The, the, the two leading industries that have provided new jobs in Alaska that's right. over the last decade has been either government, which it will be state, city, and federal right. government positions, and healthcare. And healthcare is number one. 
Business owners have been um, sh shut down without just compensation, by the way, which is a violation of the Constitution. They've been, their property has been seized. I mean, during this pandemic that we're in right now. Ch Channel 11 this morning came out with a, an article saying 11,000 people are going to be are or are going to be without a job by the end of this year. 11,000 mm -hmm. people. And they were only quoting for Anchorage. This isn't a statewide. That was just Anchorage numbers right there. 80,000 people filed unemployment in Alaska. You know, 40 million people across the United States. You know, that, that those are horrific numbers. And, and it's and it's deeply concerning but the 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 shutdown of businesses is not because of covid 19. it's because of bad government policy yeah that's that's what i see uh because it's the policy that's destroying the economy I, I'll, I'll bring up the pan uh the, the the spanish flu pandemic that happened when uh, the just like the, we're seeing now mass mandates were put into place um, and, and people were dying left and right. Big difference was is everybody was dying left and right. We're dealing with a disease right now, and if you go by the numbers and what they're showing us and what they're telling us, there's a certain age group that's being affected the most that have to be protected. You know, our seniors, they're that uh, certain people that have underlying conditions are most acceptable they should be the ones taking the largest precautions. I mean, they should. When, when did our our right to take care of our own health supersede our constitutional rights that have been given to us by our freedoms that we should be enjoying? We're, we're under a, a, a it's it's not a public health care crisis, in my opinion. It's a personal health care crisis. Uh, it's a personal health care risk. We're all at risk to some degree or another, some more at risk than others. And I think it's important we take responsibility for ourselves and protect ourselves if we're at risk and, and, and take those precautions. Yet what we've had is we've, everybody is running around in this fear-based society of, oh my gosh, I'm living out of fear. Where, what about faith? What about confidence? What about accepting the risks? For what they are and then taking measures to protect ourselves from that risk as my Part dad of, always said when i was younger you know and, and i could walk out my front door right now and step and walk go walk across the street and get hit by the crosstown bus being raised in alaska yep. i always gave up this weird look like what the hell is a crosstown bus and, um, and <laughs> yeah well and and even if you're wearing a mask you could get run over by a bus too <laughs> yeah right and so <laughs> When, when I look at how we manage this, I kind of take my own perspective as being a financial advisor. When I'm helping a client build a financial household, what's the most impart, important part of building a house? Well, that would be the foundation, foundation, wouldn't it? Well, that's risk management. So we manage the risks, okay? And whose responsibility is to manage my risks? Yours. My responsibility. So I need to take ownership of my household, myself, first. Because if, if we wanna fix this government, well, it starts looking inside the, at the mirror, looking in the mirror and looking inside ourselves. Because we get this trickle down effect of lawlessness that comes from the top of our government down, you know, over decades. We're not just talking about a current administration or current elected officials it's not just it's been, been the for last decades three and a half years yeah. it's decades long that's been going on <clears throat> you know bad policy you know and then trying to you know i i could go in so many different levels on that but you know coming back to the the situation with risk management okay as a financial advisor if i'm working with somebody as a client i issue what i call recommendations that are timely that are pertinent that are actionable, that you can actually take action on. It's not a mandate. It's not a mandate threatened by law. You have to do it this way or my way or the highway. No, it's your plan. It's your financial plan. I can just give you advice. Now, as a financial advisor, I can't give tax advice because I'm not a CPA. I can't give legal advice because I'm not an attorney. I can't give medical advice because I'm not a doctor, but I am a financial advisor and I can apply these principles to giving the advice. 
Now, why are our elected officials not taking the same approach and giving us recommendations, giving us guidelines, and giving us best practices? Like, hey, wash your hands. Hey, you know, if you're at risk, maybe consider staying home. You need some help? Maybe we can, you know, enact the churches to go help those people that are at risk and deliver them food. I've, I've given my clients, I call up my clients and I'd say, hey, you know, I'm out as an essential service industry. I'm out. If you need me to stop and buy you a gallon of milk or a, a, a carton of eggs, I'll drop it off on your doorstep. You know, that's that's because that's who I am. And that's, and that's the also mindset. what good neighbors do, too. And that's what good neighbors do. And in every crisis we've dealt with in Alaska, whether it's an earthquake or whether it's a fire or, you know, a pandemic, we've got to manage it but we can do it as a community. We don't need the hard, firm law coming down on this and you better do this or under the threat of law or a penalty or fine, you, you know. You or, just nailed upon something that's very important there um, as a community. That is one thing that mm -hmm. I've noticed during this pandemic, this virus crisis that we're all under right now. The community has been shut down. Community outreach is not allowed. You're not allowed to help your neighbor. You're supposed to live in fear of your neighbor now because they might be the harborer of this pandemic that we're all in the middle of dealing with. That's right, and, that's uh, right. Schools are shut down because where you might be a harborer of this virus, this deadly disease. And, and you, you the individual, are gonna be responsible for thousands and thousands of people dying out there. That, that's the message that I just listened to from our own mayor today. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's scary, but then I listen to Governor Dunleavy he comes out, he gives a message. It's just like you were describing a second ago. Be good neighbors to each other. If someone needs help, help them. Right. Wash your hands. That's right, that's right, exactly right. Wear your mask it's, when it's appropriate. When it's sure appropriate. Make sure people are to be safe that are in yep. those at-risk areas. That's right, and it's being respectful. And that's where respect comes in. And it is being part of the community-minded. And liberties, liberties are, are freedom with values and morals and ethics. You know, my liberties end at the end of my nose and yours begin at the beginning of your nose. Everything in between is respect. And we've got to respect everybody else and their opinion and their views and their where they're at in life. And it doesn't mean we have to agree with each other neither. And, and that's, you know, that's why, that's why I go back to the Constitution on my platform, Bert, because it's, it's not a left or a right issue. It's not a conservative or a liberal issue. It's... It's the way our government was founded upon, and these are the principles. We can agree to disagree on issues as long as we stick to the principles, and the principles are the guiding documents. We're not trying to you know, tear it apart to, to, to destroy our country. We need to combine, and you know, it's united we stand. Well, I, I, always, I grew up thinking that when you've got an elected leader, or in just general in life, that you have a mutual respect for each other in their opinions that they may hold. But you always had a common core idea that sat down in the center of it all that you were working towards. And I, I see it in Washington right now, that common core center idea no longer exists. It's all about, I want this, I want that, I want this, I want that. It's not what the what what it needs to be happening. It's everything else but that common core principle that should be uniting us all. It should be uniting us, and we can cross party lines because if we stick to the principles and we build upon that principle, then we can we can do what's in the best interests of all, and that's why we are a constitutional republic, not a democracy. We have a democratic system and a process of elections and. You know, uh, you know, but it's not a mob you just, rule. You, you said something there that is missing in conversations all the time, and, and it really needs to be pointed out. We are a republic. Constitutional republic. We, it, we're, we're, we, we guide, the, the Constitution is a guiding principles that our judicial system is supposed to uphold the law to that point, the, to, to that level. Yet they're, they're, it, they're above it. At this point, I mean, if you look at the way things are going nowadays, uh, they're be held into it by special interests. Yes, and and it's the special interests that's the good old boy club that I call it. That 
hey, you know, if you want to get into office, you got to do what these guys want to do, or because you got to go along to get along. And that comes back to the binding caucus that we have here in Alaska, which is a total mess. You know, when I heard, when I didn't understand the ramifications of that until it was brought to the light. And the words that resonated with me the most that made me absolutely mad was coercion and bribery, because those are against the law. I, if I did that in my financial practice, again, they would throw me off in a in a and throw me in a Looney Tune bin, you know, with a straitjacket. But we're seeing it not only here on a local level, where basically it's here a top sign, down. We see it in Washington D.C. Your vote has been given away for the next That's two right. years. It doesn't matter what's going to be That's in it. Right. It's going to be a yes vote. That's right. And Washington, D.C. is doing the same I've thing right now. I've seen videos of them, their staff walking around and pushing buttons for, for the congressmen and the senators that aren't even in the, in the room. Yep. Uh, you know, so think about and, this. And they're not even listening to the conversation that was just had. They, they already gave their vote away to people and said, you automatically, whatever you choose to do, this is now your vote for my state that I'm supposed to represent. So you... You bring up something there that is passionate to me about term limits. Congress, or the, the congressman is there to represent the people of the state. The senators represent the states themselves. The passing of the 17th Amendment took the, the, the stripped away the power of the legislature to put the senator into office and they gave it to the people for a popular vote of the senator. So, and I would put that as part of my Golden Rule Act, is the term limits we really need. We do. I the mean, term limits we really need, because when people come up to me and they say, hey, we really need term limits because our, our sitting congressman's been in there for 47 years. Well, yeah, okay, well, we have term limits. They're called elections. Like every two years, we could pull them out and put them back in. Oh, no, 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 that's not the term limit I'm talking about. We need limits on, you know, how long somebody should stay in office. Well, that's what the elections are for. And the, the founding fathers had put in, they, the 17th Amendment stripped away the rights of the founding fathers' intent behind it. Here's the term limits we really need. Immediate recall. When the senator gets out of a line and, and he acts or she acts and misbehaves or commits a felony or does these insider trading or backroom deals or gets wrapped up with lobbyists and special interests, then we can recall them right now I mean, we see that. in session, in, in recess between sessions. That, we that pull them out so and we replace them before the next session. Uh, that's immediate recall. That's the term limits we need. Uh, when it comes to term limits, I mean, we, we've got a, a our very own prime example, and, and you, you may uh, want, want, want to look away when I say this, but we got Senator Lisa Murkowski. Sure. And she is definitely one of those that I would classify as term limits would not be enough. We need to have immediate, an immediate recall. recall of immediate her recall. Back. And then reinstilling the 12th Amendment, She's reinforcing a, that 12th Amendment in addition to the 17th Amendment repealing that because we've gotten our election system out of whack, even with our president and vice president. That's two separate elections, not one on one ticket. Right. So what would that do to the balance of power in Washington? And if our elected officials are not in Washington, guess what? We don't get bad policy and we don't get bad financial fiscal runaway budgets because we're not passing bad legislation. And that's the type of term limit we really need to, and then hold them accountable, which is why I would require every elected official to fill out a job application, and I would require them to do 24 hours of continuing education every two years, just like I do. So if you go back, you gotta take ethics, four hours of ethics, and be held accountable to it. Because if you violate those principles, rip them out. Take him out. Immediate recall. You know, and we, we, we've got the squad. I'm just going to throw <laughs> their name out there right yeah. now. We've got the squad down in, in D.C. that's there that they've all re uh, I believe they have all so far. They have re won their reelection bid for the primaries to move on to the general election. And if, if they were forced to actually fall ethically 
standards, not a single one of them would even be in office at this point. They would have already been pulled and recalled just for their inflammatory things they say out there. And, and you know, it's okay to call somebody a bad name or a bad word, I guess, you know, but I, I don't like to do that because, you know, it's about respect. And, you know, but to lie to get into office, that is beyond reproach. That is, that is, you know, come on. We got to hold them up to a higher standard. And we have to start locally. We have to start in our community and write it here. Because then we can put forth good candidates with ethics, with morals, and with, you know, because the Constitution was written for a moral and just society. Look at where we're at today in this, in this society and the tearing away of the family values. That is by design and we are being attacked by design. I mean, we can go back to the 60s when Johnson was president of the United States and he had passed the Affirmative Action Act. And uh, basically the, 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 the laws, we had 30 years of democratic control up to that point. And uh, this is where they like to throw out, this is when the party switched, you know, the one Republican and one Democrat that went to the opposite sides. <laughs> and, uh, oh, you mean like they do now? They just call themselves a Republican name only? Is that what you're talking about? Basically a rhino, yes. Right. And uh, so, so we've got them playing off. And, and what I saw happen then was is this, the Republican Party saw the direction that Johnson had taken our country. And it, and it wasn't as, in, as, as the Democrats want to say, took our country into the racist realm and turned us, them into the, the party of, of defense of your rights and the republicans are now the racists this is the way that is portrayed on media today so but i look at it as more as the republican party saw the handwriting on the wall where welfare was taking us where these all these social programs that mm -hmm. they were now trying to make happen was taking our country the nuclear family was no longer acceptable they would rather you be an unwed mother collecting welfare and the father no longer living in the house because it made him more malleable, easier to control. Republicans didn't want that. I mean, not, at least not me anyways. Uh, you want to go out and get a job, you want to be successful, your hard work dictates where you get to be in society, not the handout you get. Well, and, and we have gotten to a point where most people have uh, allowed our country to go astray because politics are what happen when we don't get involved. And most of the people that I know, the working class, see, you know, I'm, I'm not a white collar kind of guy. Obviously I, I'm not. You know, I mean, yeah, I wear a, a coat and tie when I need to, but I was raised in a blue collar environment, rolling my sleeves up and going to work, being self-employed. You know, I, I joked about it all the time, being self-employed, I got to work half days, but I got to choose which 12 hour shift I ran. And so we've been so busy with our head in the sand, busy making a living, trying to make a living, being held in financial bondage from the debt we're consumed with. And it's keeping up with the Joneses. It's keeping up with, you know, getting it now. We got to have it now. You know, one of the, one of the pieces, and I'll throw this out there, one of, the, one of the principles that I follow is called the laws of the harvest. What you sow, so shall you reap. You plant corn, you get back corn. It's a delayed gratification. You plant it in the spring, you harvest it in the fall. And then you reap the rewards when you harvest. Or somebody else might be the benefactor of what you sowed because they're gonna reap that as well. They absolutely why don't eat. we? <laughs> why don't we give the charity back to the churches and empower the churches of our country? We're the most giving country in the entire world. Why don't we give the power back to the churches to be able to take over the social welfare programs that we, that we have today, that we've given over to the government? Think about this, oh, they, they, oh, Providence well, Hospital, St. Jude's, St. Mary's Hospital. They're named after saints because they started out as being a not-for-profit industry. And as a not-for-profit industry, me growing up, I remember that I was always told that you could always go to get health care. You could always go and they'll take care of you. Yeah, they're going to send you a bill or the charity will step up and help you pay for it. 
and we're yeah, they a give truly look at your your you financially and i'm not talking about the what you turned in for your and tax and they're not being forced to give out drugs because they get a stipend on the back end for for giving a, a drug out i mean we've got this thing all wrong you give it back to the charity give it back to the churches and allow them to take care of our homeless allow them to take care of our, our poor and impoverished you know i've got a i've got a friend who is uh growing up was a paraplegic he walked around on crutches all the time. You know, he couldn't hold down a full-time job. You know, he had one of those colonoscopy bags and stuff. And, you know, but, I mean, good friend. And, you know, but I would empower him to bring him into my, into my shop to allow him to feel worth of working when he could. And it, it's, it's the old adage of, you know, give a man a fishing pole and teach them how to fish instead of giving them a fish and a handout you give them a hand up because what happens if you you know if somebody's putting their hand out and you feed them what's going to happen well so the next thing you know again. you're going to have 10 people with their hand out trying to get a handout well why don't we give them a hand up we've, we've got generations of those expecting you to hand it to them um uh, Living in Alaska all my life, I mean, mm -hmm. you look at it and, and, and I know people are not going to like me for what I'm about ready to say, but we got a society that is built here in Alaska that has one third, over one third of our population that lives off of handouts on a daily basis. Their communities would no longer even be in existence at this point if they were required to go fish for themselves. And, and that's where that's where helping Alaska in Washington, D.C. to reclaim the lands that were, that were promised us at statehood, reclaiming that land. And, and, and then, you know, we've always been a resource state. Always. And because we don't have the population and the tax base to support the level of government we have today. I mean, even if they did instill, I'm going to just throw it out there, put a tax onto us right now, $500 million a year is, is, is their best estimate of their highest potential they'll be able to get. If well, I think that's what us. they've taken away with our PFDs. Um, and the reason we have a PFD is because it's a resource state. And instead of me having mineral rights under my ground that I own, it's community owned. It's the state owns it of all of us, we the people. We the people. We're not like Texas who they can go drill for oil or mine the minerals underneath the ground. But we have done it. We've said we want to be responsible for that. Let's develop the resources responsibly and support the state with the resources. But, but we then, can't do it through taxing them to death either. But then we also got to go, were we actually allowed to do that? I mean, who dictates ultimately which mine gets put into place, which oil well gets to be drilled? But there's processes for that. You know, and, and whether it's Pebble Mine or some of the other mines and some of the other projects that are out there, whether it's uh, timber, uh, whether it's geothermal, whether it's solar, you know, wind. I mean, there's all sorts of different alternative sources of energy and alternative resources, you know. You know and, I mean, tidal electricity. I'm still and, trying to figure out why Alaska yeah. hasn't developed. I mean, we've got the largest land mass out there with tides all around our entire state. Basically, three quarters of our entire state could be running off of tidal energy alone. And, and if the, those that want to get away from fossil fuels, here's your opportunity to do it on something that will never- As stop. long as it's done responsibly. And those are the things that having an effective leader in Washington can certainly uh, help affect that legislation by you know, the, the people coming to Washington and saying, hey, I want this project developed. And you know, it's not my job to enact that legislation, but help them get through the process by helping them develop a responsible uh, program. And, and it, so there's, there's ways that we can do that, but we have to also take into consideration that it, it's up to us to affect that change. We have to raise our kids in a responsible manner so they become active in the community, in the civics, in our political system, and, and not be polarized like we're being polarized today. And, and helping us develop the resources responsibly, helping us 
develop the community responsibly, helping us solve the issues in a responsible manner. Well, I'm, I'm going to kind of segue off into an area that you and I haven't even discussed upon at all today. Help? Yeah, you bet. Um, we, we've got our southern border between Mexico and us. We've got an immigration problem. We've got illegal immigrants that are consistently and constantly across and across the border. We've got a border wall that is being put into place right now. We've got more walls put up right now than we've ever seen in our entire lifetime of generations since they started building them. We've watched some of the most troubled areas in the United States go from tens of thousands of people crossing across the border on a monthly basis to nothing. Drug cartels that are in panic mode trying to figure out how to get their product across our borders anymore into the United States. This virus was a godsend in some ways, if you want to look at it that way. Shutting down, yeah. Shutting yeah. down our entire border. That's right. It's made it almost near impossible for them to be able to get across. Well, you look at, look at immigration. Uh, to me, there's nothing legal about illegal immigration. There isn't. It, it's either you immigrate legally or you break the law and you come into this country illegally. And, and so why don't we, instead of giving those that come across illegally or even the immigrants that do come through into sanctuary cities and then giving them Social Security and Medicare and welfare and all of that stuff, uh, why don't we help them so do you come know, in properly? Do you know how much we spend on a yearly basis for the population, that the, the 20 to 40 million, the, oh, I'll just say 20 million that they report, but the 40 million that we are, we're closer to actually having here? I'll just say it's way too much because it, $1 is too much that we give away. So I, I've got a debt clock that's been built by several very prestigious groups out there that put this together, pulling directly from the immigration uh, source from our, our departments out there for Border Patrol, and, and, and these are well-named universities that put this together. The ones that the, the Berkeleys would fall in love with, because or the people from Harvard would fall in love with, because that's the level that they're at. $278 billion is what we're on average a year spending for the illegal immigrant population that we have in, in, in America right now. They could, in four years' time, completely complete every wildest, wettest dream for infrastructure project and be 100% paid for, for what we're putting out to cater to a population that shouldn't even be here in the first place. And, and they are here, and now we have to deal with it. And there's ways that we can responsibly deal with it by those that have come in and broke the law to help them through the process of becoming a naturalized citizen, if that's what we want them to do. But if they come in illegally, they have no right to be able to take any money from our welfare system that's designed to take care of our elders and to get Social Security that they've never paid into. But the Nancy Pelosi and Schumer bring, brings up a good subject here is for them is this, the new CARES Act that, what, that they want to do, their $2 trillion plus one that they're trying to pass right now. The one that the media is focusing on the post office about but could care less about anything else that's in this $2 trillion practice, uh, package set there, has money in it to give to illegal immigrants above American citizens, and it prioritizes them over American citizens. I, I, I'm really confused where does the, the, what happened to the parties that we have? I mean, you, I can- it, It's run by special interests. It's the special interests that are perpetuating it. And part of it is designed to tear away the fabric of society by bankrupting us all. And, you know, I mean, one way it was put to me is if your outgo exceeds your income, your upkeep is going to be your downfall. Well, we've been trying to keep up for a long, long time. And, and that's the fiscal irresponsibility that we've got to change. And, we, and, and Congress holds the purse strings. And six trillion in six months. Six trillion and six, well, seven trillion has been put on the balance sheet, but it's been going on a lot longer than COVID 19 has been around. And so these are some of the things that the next congressman is going to have to work to try to solve, which is why I put forth a succession strategy. You know, two years ago, when I looked at the, the, the party system, there was nobody running 
in the primary against Congressman Young when I filed. And that was at four o'clock in the afternoon on the deadline date. Well, by Sunday, it was announced that it was now a three-party race because if somebody put their name in the hat that I'm looking at, I'm going, uh, that ain't a Republican. I don't know what that is. But, um, you know, and to me, you know, we've got to do, we've got to make a transition responsibly. And in order to make that transition responsibly, um, I put forth what I call a, a transition or a succession plan. As a financial advisor, I help business owners put together a succession strategy to exit their business accordingly. And so to exit um, somebody that's been in office for 47 years, he's not getting any younger. We've got to look forward into the future and try to put a plan in place. Because in my world, you know, we, you know, we don't plan to fail, we just fail to plan. And no plan is a plan. So we got to plan our work and work our plan. That's part of my mindset as a financial planner. And so the succession strategy is to take Congressman Young back to office as an advisor so that we have somebody with experience because we're going to go from dean of the house to junior congressman no matter what Alaska does. We're going to go from hero to zero. We're going to, I mean, the new person that's going to get thrust in there has got to have somebody with experience or at least as a, an advisor that we can bring back and say, hey, you know, what did you do about this? And then we would have somebody with wisdom that we could learn from. I mean, that's the just responsibility of, you know, respecting our elders, right? Well, we don't, we don't, that way, you, best way to describe that, you're not walking into the swamp and the swamp grabs a hold of you and says, whispers in your ear, this is what we do, versus here's what the people that are not in the middle of the swamp want you to, That's to right. at least listen to but it's too late you're already been entrapped by that monster. exactly that exactly and that's why i put together a, a solid succession strategy and a sound plan and inside of that i would invite congressman don young back as my chief advisor and here's what i envision that looking like him saying don't go that way that's the swamp stay away from these people they're no good these are people you can trust Here's what we've done for 47 years. Here's why we've done it this way. Here's what we still need to accomplish. And, and that to me is a, is, is a respectful transition strategy that Alaska needs to take into serious consideration. Two years ago, I, I debated uh, a couple of candidates up at the League of Women Voters up in Fairbanks, and I was sitting on the platform of the Constitution which is not a left or a right issue. It's principles of our founding documents of our country. And I was literally debating between socialism and communism. And I'm like, I don't want my kids being raised in China, right? I don't want my kids being raised in, in, a, in Venezuela. I, I want, you know, I mean, this is the land of the free and the home of the brave. This is, we, we need to get back to the American values that we have we were founded upon, which is the free enterprise economic system. And in order to do that, we have to have that type of representation in Washington, D.C. And the place to do that is in the primary, not in the general election, where it can be opened up to socialism. Right. That's, that, that's the plan. And oh, by the way, Congressman Young agreed to come back with me if I win and when I win the election. That yeah, I love that. <laughs> so, so basically, if you you come out ahead on this thing and you're you're the winner of this election, Congressman Don Young is is more than willing. And and and, and honestly, I've even heard him say it because I I shared the video before I I started I, I the just live put it out today. today. Yeah, because I think it's important that at least we understand and recognize that that's a true succession strategy, and that's what Alaska really needs. We we've you know we. It's better than throwing them to the wolves. I'll give it a Or, uh, you know, little, heaven little forbid, ha, you know, none of us get out of this earth alive. And I think, you know, we only have one living congressman today. Where most states have multiple successor 
you know, congressmen that have been around that are at least there for, we can go to for advice. California is what, got 13? Well, <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, they yeah but they have a lot more people than we do too. One. We have one voice in Washington. Who do we want to send back to represent all Alaskans? Another Pelosi? How about somebody <laughs> that is going to respect the Constitution, that's going to respect the individual rights and their per perception, their perspective, and give them an opportunity to have that voice and then, you know, be able to create that dialogue and somebody that's willing to listen. And I think that's me. So it was, uh, the more I've talked to you and the, and the more that I've gotten to know you here in, in the last few hours, uh, there, there's one thing that's become pretty clear to me. You, you've got a really partisan, bipartisan point of view of, of looking at how politics should be run. You, you're not fighting, you, you have yet to ever say anything bad about the Democrats. You have yet to ever say anything bad about the Republicans. Yeah. You've always been sticking straight to the middle of the party and parties and saying, I want what is best for both sides. Well, here's so that all of America wins. And, and it has to be that way because it's not about my imposing my will on somebody else. It's not about my values imposing them on somebody else. It's respect. And that's the space in between everybody, right? Because, you know, my liberties end at my nose and I've got to respect other people's viewpoint, doesn't mean I have to agree with them. Right. And I don't need to be forced to agree with them either or forced to pay for what they want because they want it. So there's, there's middle ground there, but you know, as- So in other words, you're not an I, I, I want this, I want that, I want that. We, it's us. We Alaskans. We Alaskans. And, and, and I was born and raised here. This is my home and my kids, you know, my grandkids, they're third generation. You know, my grandparents moved up here in 1948. My parents, or my grandparents home, uh, settled in Anchorage. My wife's grandparents homesteaded in Willow back in the 60s, right? And we met in the middle and raised our family in Chugiak for 30 years. But it, what, what I wanted to get to was, you know, as, as somebody that's been a lifelong Republican, except for one year, that was when the Republican Party uh, threw a lawsuit out there, well, excuse me, a complaint out there about uh, another candidate that I felt was a better position. And then I changed to a, a different party for one year. And I says, okay, that's not working either. <laughs> but in my opinion, my Republican party that I knew left me years ago because it was under a Republican president, a Republican Congress and a Republican Senate that we gave away more of our rights <laughs> with the Patriot Act after September 11th, 2001. And that bill, by the way, was written prior to September 11th. It just needed a, a something to enact it. Oh, here's an event, advance. you know, remember, don't let any crisis go to waste. We got to take advantage of this and put forth this horrible, uh, atro atrocious attack on our liberties. And, and we can't allow our liberties to keep getting eroded this way. You know, same thing with the, with the pandemic here. You know, we gave away, you know, we, we walked away and left our First Amendment just sitting there. Our right to travel, which is part of the freedom of speech. I think right we talked about that. Right to own and operate a business. Right to, you know, I mean, it, it comes back to being responsible ourselves. You know, and, you know, for an example, you know, I, we talked a little bit about Social Security. Well, I call it so-so security because it may or may not be there in the form that it's in there currently for our generation, our next generation. Well, we're, and we're like at a 2035, they're predicting 2035, it to be as we talked about, but that's Congress that needs to take that up. And Medicare and Medicaid, you know, for 15 years as a financial advisor in the financial services industry, for 15 years I've been screaming at the top of my lugs. We think there's a problem with social security, we haven't seen nothing when it comes to the Medicaid and Medicare time bomb that's ticking. There's not enough oil on the pipeline in Alaska to protect Alaska when that Medicare bomb goes off. Oh, we're and so it's to already it. going off. We've seen it over the last couple of years. The expansion, the federal government says, here's the floor. This is the minimum you offer for Medicaid, right? So we have Medicaid minimums that we offer. But Alaska, they go, oh, well, let's just jack it way up here. We're gonna offer all of this stuff more generous than any other state 
and we don't have the budget to pay for that. Oh, and no. we wonder why we're in a fiscal crisis. I mean, 2018, we had $2.5 billion being budgeted for our health and social, Department of yeah. Health and Social Services here. Here we are in 2020, and they spent $3.6 billion, roughly a $1.1, $1.2 billion increase in just right. two short years. You, you and could, the federal portion is decreasing. Yeah. And our Alaskan share is increasing. What's going to happen to it? It's just going to grow. Well, and who's going to pay for that? My children's children? Is, is that who we're expecting? You know, I mean, again, it goes back to, you know, you could probably tell I'm a little passionate about this stuff. And, and it's beyond being mad. I'm passionate about it. I wear my heart on my sleeve. What you see is what you get. This is who I am. And, and I am a voice. And I think all Alaskans are a voice, and we can't allow Alaska not to have a voice in Washington, D.C. We need strong leadership back there. Who better to send back to Washington than a financial advisor that deals with budgets, fiscal responsibility, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid? Those are all in my wheelhouse. I deal with those on a daily basis today. And something that's going to look at the people as individuals for we Alaskans versus I, I know the, the, the who the, the other candidate that is running out there that's on the other spectrum of the party. And uh, the only message that I'm hearing coming from that direction is the same one that Pelosi is putting out, the same one that AOC is putting out. We there. don't want an AOC representing Alaska in Washington, D.C., in my opinion. And we have two of them right now, one that's running for the Senate and another one that's running for the congressman seat. And, you know, it, well, it's up to Alaskans. It's up to Alaska to decide who they send back from in, in, in next week's election in the primary to the general election. It's up to Alaskans who they want to put forth to represent them in Washington. And we need to think hard and long of what our plan is for that. Well, I look at it as we've got a choice to make. Do we want to be able to still have the, the, the constitutional rights that we have been given as a country for the last 244 years? Or do we want to vote for a person that's going to do nothing but take those rights away? Mm -hmm. that, that's the choice I see in front of us right now. Do we want to maintain our freedoms? Or do you want to be under the control of government and what they tell us to do? To me, it's all about liberties and freedom because this is, this is the, founding, uh, the foundation of our country. And we cannot afford to give them up because the more we allow government to take away our rights, the more dependent we become on that governor, government. And then we get the tyranny that we see happening in Anchorage, in other parts of this country. And it's because we have empowered them Think, and, and that leads right to states' rights. It, it's not the, the federal government's responsibility to pay for health care. It's the state's responsibility to do that. That's why the Affordable Care Act was a violation of the law, because it's a state's rights issue. So most of the things that we're dealing with are states' rights. You have the executive, the legislative, and the judicial branch of government. And and, and we've kind of got that upside down because the courts issue opinion. They don't write the law. And we have courts writing law today. We do. And that becomes a huge issue. Okay. And, you know, and then we've got the legislative branch that's turned over the executive branch to the executive branch, the power to write laws. Wait a minute. That's up to the legislation to write the laws. It's up to the executive branch to execute the law and the to judicial, judicial branch, branch to, make sure to make sure it's constitutional, right? But a court issues an opinion, and it's just an opinion. And when they issue a bad opinion, it's our job to ignore the courts. We, we've already seen that just we, in this last uh, couple of years here in Alaska, the, the judicial branch, mm -hmm. legislators pass something, our governor approves it, and then the judicial branch comes back and says, oh, nope, both are wrong. I'm going to force you to put that right back in there, whether you like it or That's not. Right. That's right. And uh, but when did they become more powerful than both the legislative branch and our executive branch? And, and think about this. So if if we're up against the federal government and we're going to, and we dis, the state disagrees with them and we sue them in their court, wait a minute. 
Think about this for a minute. If, you know, if, if you're a trustworthy guy, if I needed to borrow your vehicle to go down to the store, you would probably allow me to borrow it, wouldn't you? Probably. Probably, okay. But do I have any rights to that vehicle? None. You, None. You, you don't own None. it. None, other than the permission. Yes. And I don't own it. And if I didn't give it back, what's your recourse? Oh, besides hunting me down and shooting me? I'd get the judicial branch on my you side. Would, I'd call you the would, police. And... You would file a complaint. You would take me to court and you would sue me, right? But if you sued me in court and my relatives were the judge, the jury, the, the court clerk, the bailiff, would you have any chance of getting your vehicle back? None. So why are we suing the federal government in their court? Why don't we bring them to our court here in Alaska? Because who is a higher authority, the state or the federal government? The state is a higher authority than the federal government, and we forget that. We forget that as we the people of these United States. It was the states that created the federal government. And, but I'll, I'll give the, the catch-22 to it all. We've got the judges that are in our federal government that are... But remember, we bring them to our court. We don't sue them. We wait for them to sue us. And then we ignore the court when they're out of order and when they violate the Constitution. We just have to understand the process. And we have to have the leadership in, in, in the community, in the city, in the government, in, in, in the state, and we have to have the leadership in Washington to be able to stand up to the tyranny that we're up against. And not run and hide when things get a little tough. And, which... and you know what? That's putting on the full armor of God because God didn't give us any armor for our hiney to turn around and run away with. <laughs> you know, and... This is who I am, Bert, you know, and I, 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 you know, I know that you would love to go on and I've got things I've got to get done and I've enjoyed this and sharing with the people of Alaska. Uh, the message to Alaskans is we have to think about the next congressman of who we're going to put in and when and how we're going to do it. And I offer that succession strategy. And, and it's a refreshing one too, because I actually go and, and say, hey, if you elect me, I'm going to take Congressman Don Young as uh, as uh, an advisor with me, so that he can keep the swamp away and teach me where Alaskans gonna, uh, should be in the next 10, 20, 30 years from now. Whether you're that person that sticks out that long, I mean, you're talking term limits. Yeah, you know, so. he might outlive both of us to combined. You know, but at the same <laughs> that, that time, that would not surprise me. I know, I mean, really but at would. the same time, I think he's a national treasure. And Alaska needs to protect our national treasure. That's the respect we have to offer. It doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, but we it does command respect. And that's important too. Well, John Nelson, it has been a very much a pleasure getting to talk to you here today. I appreciate the and, time uh, so, and the I, platform. And I, I respect you and what your work. <laughs> you know, you're, we need more journalists that are seeking the truth like you and I appreciate you doing that well thank you I, I get knocked all the time because uh, people don't want to look at me as someone that is a journalist in fact today I got called a propagandist <laughs> um, and for doing nothing more than showing up being there listening to people showing up at the meetings showing up with there's a good protest going on I guarantee you, I'm gonna be there and I always like to say I'm politic, I'm unfiltered. I don't filter the content that I have that is being presented to people. It doesn't mean that I'm there in solidarity of support of their actions, nor am I there to disrupt them. And it's having a candid conversation. And I think we need more dialogue like we're having right now. To, to, to have honest opinions, to be able to hear what each other thinks. I mean, uh, Right, and, and again, we're not gonna agree on everything, but that's, if we agreed on everything, then one of us is useless. <laughs> that, right? that is so true. Well, if, you, if we always agree, why do we need me? R well, or you, yeah, just you. me. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Well, thank you, John Nelson. This is John Nelson running for Congress for a year in Alaska to represent us down in, in D.C. Uh, it's time to get out and vote. August 18th is only three days away. I mean, four days if, if, if you want to be eh, kind of technical about it. But 
You got three days to bring five of your friends. Call them up. Say, hey, are you ready to go vote? Get out and vote. Just and then exercise your right. When it comes time to vote, go and stop by your neighbor's house and say, hey, do you need a lift to the polling stations, a place to be able to go vote? Sure. Guess what? I even got an extra, extra mask for you if you want it. Um, <laughs> That's just, right. Just to come until you right. feel safe and, and secure in your environment. Yeah. But don't hesitate. If we don't get out there and vote, we've That's got a right. 17 to 20 percent voter turnout in our primaries here in Alaska. We need to be seeing at least a 25 to a 30 percent turnout, both in the primaries and in the November election. This is too critical here in our state, both on a, on a local level and on a national level. If we don't start voting people into office that are going to start making a change for us out there, someone that's going to be people that are going to represent and be servants of Alaskans, not representing themselves, not going to Juno to say, I, 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 and the special interests that I represent, I'm, uh, we need, and in the same level when it goes to going to Congress, we need somebody that's not going to be an I, I, I person. She's tried to run now for the last two years for that seat <laughs> and work for the special interest. We need someone that's going to be there to work for Alaskans. I'm available. And, and, and I've got, I uh, really do hope you the best in, in being able to get there. I mean, you, you've got my vote this year. Um, I. I don't want to see Congressman Gone Young go. I think that makes a baker's dozen now, so there we go. <laughs> and uh, But I, I want to be able to see you. You got the, the, the plan that I think would make the best succession to, to making sure that we go from Dean to junior uh, congressman down in With a in simple transition that's seamless. Yes. And, and so that you're not just thrown into the swamp. I mean, the alternative... Or being picked by nepotism. That, that is even scarier. We've got a senator that's been t picked that yeah. way. And yep. the, speaking of which, i, I, I got to throw this in there because of that. Senator Lisa Murkowski was voted back in um, when, when she got voted, and it was done on a write-in campaign. And we've got our nation right now up in turmoil, turmoil about vote by mail. We had a senator that sent campaign representatives with pre-filled out ballots with her name oh, already oh, filled man. out on the ballots and walked into our rural communities and went door to door, knocking on their doors, saying sign down at the bottom line and check all the boxes. And just to make sure you know, in case you don't know how to spell Murkowski's name, we've already filled the write in for you. You don't get that choice of who you want to write in. We did it for you. Voter fraud. We need to protect that. And, and we, you know, yep. And, and and they say that this doesn't happen. We've got the it prime happens. example it of happens. that happening and yep. taken to court and proven in court thousands and thousands of identical signatures writing in that name, Lisa Murkowski, down on the bottom of that ballot. And they're trying to tell us right now that vote by mail isn't going to be corrupt. You know, and I appreciate you bringing that up because uh, two years ago, my household received six uh, voter guides. Wow. And I'm thinking, what if those were ballots? And then I picked one up. Then my wife, she could have gone and picked one up. And I'm thinking, and I got pictures of them all. And I'm like, uh, this is a huge issue. You know, one was sent to my daughter who's living in Texas, right? And she's still on the voter guide list, the voters list. And, and if we're going to do mail-in ballots, sure she's registered and, in Texas. And, and when we re relocated after becoming empty nesters out here to the valley, the previous owners both received one. So that's three right there. And then my wife and I got one. And then I picked one up. And this is vote by mail where they just go off of that voter registry roster of and, where your and, address is. And, and it's not just the voter's guide that's of issue there. And it's not just absentee, but if we went to the vote by mail system, that's another piece that opens up that can of worms. And we don't need that here in Alaska. Yeah, I'm all so. for absentee because then that means you or I or whoever wants that absentee ballot has taken the steps to go and get it, apply for it, show the documentation of who and what they are so that they know that it's not some dog or some cat that somehow got onto the voter registry, like we're seeing a few instances of right now, um, versus vote by mail is nothing more than taking, I mean, Alaska guys, 111% voter registry <laughs> right now. 
So 11% of our population that probably doesn't exist, they may be dead, will be receiving a ballot to vote if they were to send it out all by mail-in voting versus absentee voting. And it's probably even more now with the amount of people that are leaving out of state. Yeah, I I know more than one of my friends has uh, finally Mm -hmm. threw in the towel and are no longer here and businesses that this is, I'm one of those people right now that's really wondering if I'm going to survive through this winter. My business has been cut by over 40% this summer. As has a lot of businesses, and that's a huge concern. And we, you know, the, the economic impact, and I get, you know, it goes right back to bad policy. It's not because of a pandemic. It's because of the bad policy that comes out because of that. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, businesses that I normally I'd be making my nest egg right now that I live off of through my winter months. Because yeah. just like most of the people that are in business in Alaska, tourism is our trade. Well, maybe that's something that we can talk about after off, off the camera. <laughs> that sounds good. That sounds good. Again, <laughs> again one, one more you. time. This is uh, John Nelson running for Alaska Congress seat uh, for the House of Representatives here for, uh, to represent us for Alaska. Yeah. Um, get out and vote August 18th. It is just three days away. And uh, as always, I like to say this at the very end is, is Facebook squeals on you if you don't share. So share, share, share. Alaskans need to be able to hear from these candidates around the state and what their opinions and views are so that we have informed voters out there that understand the issues before they go to the polls and just hit, start checking boxes because of name recognition. We need to make sure that they vote because they know what they're looking for. The other aspect that I want to throw out there is is this has turned into a full-time job. I'm working my butts off to be able to provide these interviews, be at assembly meetings, be at uh, town halls, show up at a local protest like we just had in Anchorage this last past week. But it all takes money to be able to get there. Please go to my website, politidic.com. That's P-O-L-I-T-A-D-I-C-K.com. Click that donate button. Every penny counts. Everything goes to increasing my content, making sure my gas tank's got enough gas in it to make sure I can get there on time and bring this unfiltered to you. And Thank is, you all for tuning in. And is it okay if I give my contact information as well? I'll go right ahead. Let them all know how yep. to get a hold of you. So if you want to get a hold of me, you can uh, email me at john at johnnelsonforalaskans.com. You can visit us on our uh, 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 Facebook page, which is Nelson for Alaskans. Or you can or or? uh, F O R Nelson's for Alaskans because I'm all I'm for all Alaskans Uh, or my website John Nelson for Alaskans.com feel free to send me an email send me a text Uh, my phone numbers out there for everybody it's public information 907-360-1572 feel free to give me a call I'm happy to answer your questions and thank you uh, for voting thank you John appreciate it all right Appreciate it, and have a good night, folks. Appreciate your time. Quick Thanks question. for joining us. How are you tonight? Hi, good. What yeah. are you running for? For U.S. House of Representatives for Congress. 